spiritual growth pink number 15 I believe and we're on the chapter called its decline spiritual growth its decline and uh, we'll, uh, we'll begin where we left off again if a Christian accords not to the Word of God that honor to which it is so justly entitled he is certain to be the loser if the word holds not that place in his affections, thoughts, and daily life which its author requires, then sad will be the consequences. If the soul be not nourished by this heavenly bread, if the mind be not regulated by its instructions, if the will be not directed by its precepts, disastrous must be the outcome. <clears throat> we must expect God to hide his face from us if we seek him not in those ways wherein he has promised to meet with us and bless us. For such a neglect is both a violation of his ordinance and disregard of our, for, of our own good. I may spend as much time in reading the Bible today as I ever did before, but am I doing so with a definite and solemn treating with God therein? If not, if my approach is be less spiritual, if my motive be less worthy, then the decline has already begun. And I need not to beg God to revive me. And I need to beg God to revive me, quicken my appetite, and make me more responsive to his injunctions. Finally, it requires few words here to convince a believer that if there be decreasing occupation of the heart with Christ, his fine gold will soon be gun dim. If he ceases to grow in spiritual knowledge of his Lord and Savior, if he becomes lax in desiring and seeking real communion with him, if he fails to draw from the fullness of grace which is available for his people, then a blight will fall upon all his graces. Faith in him will weaken, love for him will abate, obedience to him slacken, and he will be followed at a great greater distance. His own words on this point are too clear to admit a mistake. He that abideth in me and I in him, note the order, we always, we are always the first to make the breach. The same bringeth forth much fruit, his graces are healthy, and his life abounds in good works. For severed from me, cut off from fellowship, you can do nothing. John 15, 5. The same things which oppose our first coming to Christ will seek to hinder our cleaving to him. And against those enemies, we must watch and pray. <clears throat> Faith which worketh by love, Galatians 5, 6. Since it is with the heart man believeth, Romans 10, 10. Saving faith and spiritual love cannot be separated, though they may be distinguished. Faith engages the heart with Christ, and therefore its affection is drawn out unto him. Thus faith is a par powerful dynamic in the soul and acts, to borrow the words of Thomas Chalmers, an impulsive power of a new affection. A little child may be amusing himself with some filthy or dangerous object, but present to him a luscious pearl or peach, he will speedily relinquish it. The world absorbs the heart and mind of the unregenerate because he is of the world and knows nothing, so knows nothing better. For the Christ of God is a stranger to him, but the regenerate has a new nature and by faith becomes occupied with him who is the center of heaven's glory. And the more the mind be strayed from him, the less appeal with the perishing things of time and sense make upon him. It is faith and exercise upon its glorious object with overcometh the world. Roman numeral 2. We have pointed out the deep importance of, of ascertaining the causes from which spiritual decays proceed in order to bring us to a due compliance with the injunctions of Revelation 2.5. We cannot turn from that which is injurious and avail ourselves of the remedy until we are conscious of and sensibly affected by those things which have robbed of us our spiritual health. But let not the young Christian assume a defeatist attitude and conclude that ere long he will too suffer a decline. Prevention is better than cure. To be forewarned is to be forearmed. This aspect of the theme should serve a dual purpose, a warning against such a calamity, and is furnishing instruction for those whose graces have already begun to languish. Thus far, we have already dealt only on what will be the inevitable consequences if the believer fails to make a diligent and full use of the chief aids to spiritual growth. Now we proceed to point out other things which are among the causes of decline. A slackening in the prayer life will soon lower the level of one's spiritual health. This is so generally recognized among Christians that there is less need for us to say much therein. Prayer is an ordinance of divine appointment being instituted both for God's glory and our own good. It is an owning of his supremacy and an acknowledgement of our dependency. On the one hand, the Lord requires to be waited on, to be asked for those things which will minister unto our well-being. And on the other hand, it's by means of prayer that our hearts are prepared to receive or be denied those things which we desire. For it is essentially a holy exercise in which our wills are brought into harmony with the divine. 
a considerable part of our religious life consists in praying, either in public or in private, either orally or mentally. And in our spiritual prosperity, ever bears a close proportion to the degree of fervor and constancy with which this important duty is attended to. Prayer has been rightly termed the breath of the new creature. And if our breathing be impeded, then the whole system suffers, true alike spiritually and naturally. But prayer is more than a duty to also one of the two principal means of grace, and without it the other, the word profits us little or nothing. Since prayer be the breath of the new creature, we need to live in its own element, the atmosphere of heaven. In order thereto, a new and living way has been opened to the throne of grace, whither we may come with boldness and confidence, and there find help. Help for what? For everything needed in the Christian life, and more particularly, for enablement to comply with the divine precepts. That which God requires from us may be summed up in one word, obedience. And it is only through prayer we obtain strength for the performance thereof. This is partly the meaning of, for the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ, John 1.17. The law reveals man's duty, but it conveys no power for the discharge of it. But grace, as well as truth, comes to us by Jesus Christ, as the previous verse tells us. Yet there is no way of receiving out of fullness except by faith prayer, but the prayer of faith. Here's a good way to put it. The law is our guide for sanctification. And Rush Dune used to take a lot of heat because he'd say, yeah, we're justified by faith, but we're sanctified by the law. And what he means by that, he doesn't mean that we're not sanctified by the Spirit. He means that the, that the law is the, the, uh, the duty. It is the guide. It is the, the regulation. Now, we need the Spirit to cause us to want to obey the law, to, well, to understand the law first, to enlighten our minds, and then to want to obey the law, to give us the power to obey. And that, of course, is based on the efficacy of the life, death, and resurrection, our being united to him by the Holy Spirit. And therefore, we pray for that efficacy to be fully in effect. Prayer is even more than a means of grace. It is a holy privilege as an unspeakable boon in estimable favor, and it should be the most delightful of all spiritual exercises. If by prayer we have access to God and converse with him, whereby he becomes more and more a living reality into the soul, it is then that we draw near to him, and he draws near to us. And there is a sacred converse, the one with the other. Thereby we commune with and delight ourselves in him. It is while we are thus engaged that the Spirit graciously fulfills his office work as the Spirit of Adoption. Hereby we cry, Father, Father. We then find he is more ready to hear than we are to speak. Pleading the merits of Christ, we enjoy the most blessed fellowship with him and obtain fresh foretaste of the everlasting bliss awaiting us on high. It is to be reconciled, to a reconciled Father we come, as his dear children. If we approach in the spirit of the prodigal son, the same welcome spirits awaits us, awaits us and the same tokens of love are received by us. It is then we are to made to exclaim, Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. And that we pour out our own hearts before him in praise and adoration. Now contemplate a slackening of the power of prayer life in the light of the three things pointed out above. And what must be the inevitable consequences? How can I prosper if I shirk my duty? How can the blessing of God rest upon me if I largely refuse that which he requires from me? If prayer be also one of the chief means of grace and I neglect it, am I not forsaking my own mercies? If it be the only channel through which I obtain fresh supplies of grace from Christ, shall I not necessarily be feeble and sickly? If my strength be not removed, how can I successfully resist my spiritual foes? If no power from on high be received, how can I be able to tread the path of obedience? And if, <coughs> and if prayer be the principal channel of communion and converse with God, and that holy privilege be lightly esteemed, will not God soon become less real? My heart grow cold, my faith languish, and my joy vanish? Yes, a slackening in the prayer life most certainly entails spiritual decline with all that accompanies the same. Sitting under an unedifying ministry. God has appointed and equipped certain men to act as his shepherds to feed his sheep. He speaks of them as pastors according to mine heart, which shall feed you with knowledge and understanding, Jeremiah 13, 15. In the ordinary course of events, it is his method to employ human instrumentality, and therefore he has provided steward, gifted stewards for the perfecting of the saints, Ephesians 4, 11 and 12. 
Satan knows that, and hence he raises up false prophets to deceive and destroy. 2 Corinthians 11, 13 to 15 warns us that such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into apostles of Christ. Nor should we be surprised at this, for Satan himself is transformed as an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers be transformed as ministers of righteousness. Those ministers of his have long held most of the professors' chairs in the seminaries. Thousands have occupied the pulpits of almost every denomination, and the great majority of those who sat under them were corrupted and fatally deluded by a spacious mixture of truth and lies. The real Christians who attended injuriously affected. It is because of the presence of these disguised ministers of Satan that God bids his people, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits whether they be of God, for many false prophets are gone out into the, into the professed world, professing world, John 4 and 1. Try them by the unerring standard of holy writ. To the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them, Isaiah 8, 20. God holds you responsible to prove all things, 1 Thessalonians 5.21, and commends those who have tried those who say they are apostles and are not, and have found them liars, Revelation 2.2. 2. His urgent command to each of his children is, Cease, my son, to hear the instructions that cause thee to err from the words of knowledge, Proverbs 21.27. <clears throat> that is not optional, but obligatory, and we disregard it at our peril. Listening to false doctrines is highly injurious, for it causes to err from right beliefs and right practices. The ministry we sit under affects us for the good or evil, and therefore our master enjoins us, Take heed what ye hear, Mark 4.24. 4, it is a far greater moment that young Christians realize that they heed what has just been pointed out. The reading matter we perfume, we peruse and the religious instruction we imbibe has a real influence has, re, has real an influence and effect upon the mind and soul as that which we eat and drink does on the body if it be corrupt and poisonous it affects will be identical in each case proof of that is found in the history of the galatians to them the apostle said you did run well who did hinder you that you should not obey the truth five seven and the answer was heretics judaizers who perverted the gospel and the saint today is hindered, driven back, if he attends the preaching of error. Therefore, shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness, and their word will eat as doth a canker. 2 Timothy 2, 16 and 17. The teaching of heretics diffuses a noisome influence, till it eats away the life and power of piety, as a gangrene spreads throughout a limb. But one may sit under what is termed a sound ministry, and, though no fault of his own, derive no benefit from the same. There is a dead orthodoxy, now widely prevalent, where the truth is preached, yet in, in an unctionless manner. And if there be no life in the pulpit, there is not likely to be much in the pew. Unless the message comes fresh from God, issues warmly and earnestly from the preacher's heart, and be delivered in the power of the Holy Spirit, he will neither reach the heart of the hearer, nor minister that which causes him to grow in grace. There is a many a place in Christendom where a living, refreshing, soul-edifying ministry once obtained, but the Spirit of God was grieved and quenched, and a visit there is like entering a morgue. Everything is cold, cheerless, lifeless. The offices and members seem putrefied, and to attend such services is to be chilled and become partaker of that deadening influence. A ministry which does not lift the soul Godwards, produces joy in the Lord, and stimulate to greater obedience, cast the soul down, and soon brings it into a sloth of despondence. Uh, and, you know, watching all the advertising for Easter, and the, the advertising that we see of the churches around here, how are they advertised? How are evangelical churches advertised today? Come to our church. We have great entertainment. We have an uplifting message of humanism, basically. Look at our entertainment. Look at all the programs for your children. It's like a social club. Preaching is not emphasized at all. Only the today can come will review how many a babe in Christ has had his growth arrested through sitting under a ministry well supplied him 
uh, which supplied him not with the sincere milk of the word. Only that day will show how many a young believer in the warmth and glow of his first love was discouraged and dismayed by the coldness and deadness of the place where he went to worship. No wonder that God so rarely regenerates any under such a ministry. Those places would not prove at all suitable as nurseries for his little ones. Many a spiritual decline is to be attributed to this very cause. Then take heed, young Christian, where you attend. If you cannot find a place where Christ is magnified, where his presence is felt, where his word is ministered in the power of the Spirit, where your soul is actually fed, where you come away as empty as when you went, then far better to remain at home and spend the time on your knees, feeding directly on God's word, and reading that which you do find helpful in your spiritual life. Companionship with unbelievers. Enter not into the path of the wicked, and go not into the way of wicked men. Proverbs 4, 14. I have written unto you not to keep company with the world. 1 Corinthians 5, 10. And 11. The word for company here means to mingle. We cannot avoid contact with the unregenerate, but we must see to it that our hearts do not become attached to them. Indeed, the Christian is to have a good will toward all he encounters, seeking their best interest, Galatians 6.10. But he is to have no pleasure in or complacency toward those who despise his master. It is forbidden to walk with the profane in a way of friendship. Be not unequally yoked with unbelievers, 2 Corinthians 6.14. For familiarity with them will speedily dull the edge of your spirituality. 1 Corinthians 15.33. Be not deceived, evil communications, corrupt good manners. We cannot disregard these divine precepts with impunity. Know you not that friendship with the world is enmity with God? James 4.4. 4. A companion of fools shall be destroyed. Proverbs 13.20. But it is not only the openly profane and lawless who are to be shunned by the saint. He needs especially to avoid empty professors, by which we mean those who claim to be Christians but who do not live the Christian life. Those who are church members or in fellowship with some assembly but whose conduct is careless and carnal. Those who attend service on Sunday, but who may be found at the movies or at the dance hall during the week. You can tell this was written a long time ago. And, and there are still, the, you know, the Free Presbyterian Church of Scotland, uh, Heritage Reformed, um, and uh, Dotson, you know, uh, any, any, time, any kind of TV or movies or anything, it's all forbidden. You, you know, it, it would be forbidden to watch a movie, I guess, about Martin Luther. The empty professor is far more dangerous as a close acquaintance than one who makes no profession. The Christian is less on his guard with the former, and having some confidence in him is more than easily inf is more easily influenced by him. Beware of those who say one thing and do another, whose talk is pious but whose walk is worldly. The word of God is plain and positive on this point, having a form of godliness but in action denying the power the reality thereof. From such turn away, 2 Timothy 3.5. If you do not, they will soon drag you down with themselves into the mire. O young Christians, your companions, those with whom you most closely associate, exert a powerful influence upon you either for good or for evil. Far better than you should tread a lonely path with Christ than that you attend, offend him by cultivating friendship with religious worldlings. He that liveth in a mill, the flower will stick upon his clothes. Man receiveth an insensible taint from the company he keepeth. He that liveth in a shop of perfumes is often handed, uh, handling them, carried away with some of their fragments. So be converse with the godly. We are made like them. And that's just simply a Puritan. He, he, it's a quote from a Puritan. He doesn't know the name. He that walketh with wise men will be wise. Proverbs 13.20 In selecting your closest friend, let not a pleasing personality allure. There are many wolves in sheep's clothing. Be more careful in seeing to it that what draws you to and makes you desire the Christian companionship of another is his or her love and likeness to Christ and not his love and likeness to yourself. I am a companion of all those that fear thee and them that keep thy precepts. Psalm 119.63 Should be the aim and endeavor of the child of God. Though such characters indeed are very scarce these evil days, they are only companions worth ha they are the only companions worth having, for they alone will encourage you to press forward on the narrow way. <clears throat> it is not those who profess to believe in the Lord, but those who give evidence they revere him. Not those who merely profess to stand for his precepts, but those who actually perform them. 
that you see, need to seek out. So far from sneering at your strictness, they will strengthen you therein. Give salutary counsel. Be fellow helpers in prayer and piety. The godly will quicken you to more godliness. Their conversation is on sacred topics, and they will draw out your affections to things above. If you are unable to locate any of these characters, then make it your earnest prayer. Psalm 119.79 Let those who fear thee turn unto me, and those that know thy testimonies. An undue absorption with worldly things. Worldly is a term that means very different things in the minds and mouths of different people. Some Christians complain that their minds are worldly when they simply mean that for the time being, and often rightly so, their thoughts are entirely occupied with temporal matters. We do not propose to enter into a close defining of the term, but would point out that the performing of those duties which God assigns us in the world, or the availing ourselves of the conveniences such as trains, the telephone, the printing press, or even enjoying the comforts which it provides, food, clothing, housing, are certainly not worldly in any evil sense. That which is injurious to the spiritual life is time wasted in worldly pleasures, the heart absorbed in worldly pursuits, the mind obsessed by worldly cares. It is the love of the world and its things which is forbidden. And very close watch needs to be kept on the heart. Otherwise, it will glide insensibly into the snare, into this snare. The case of Lot supplies the most solemn warning against this evil. He yielded to a spirit of covetousness and so consulted temporal advantages that the spiritual warfare, welfare of his family was disregarded. When Abraham invited him to make choice of a portion of Canaan for himself and his herds, instead of remaining in the vicinity of his uncle, upon whom the blessing of the Most High rested, he lifted up his eyes, acted by sight rather than by faith, and beheld all the plain of Jordan, that it was well watered everywhere. Then Lot chose him. All the plain of Jordan and Lot journeyed east. Thus he went outside of the land and itself, for we are told Abraham dwelt in the land of Canaan, and Lot dwelt in the cities of the plain, and pitched his tent toward Sodom. Genesis 13, 8 to 10. Nor did that contend him. He became an alderman in Sodom, Genesis 18, 1, and discarded the pilgrim's tent for a house, verse 3. How disastrous the sequel was both to himself and his family is well known. One form of worldliness, which has spoiled the life and testimony of many a Christian, is politics. We will not now discuss the question whether or not a saint ought to take any interest in politics, but simply point out that it should be evident to all with spiritual discernment, namely, that to take an eager and deep concern in politics must remove the edge from any spiritual appetite. I don't agree with that. It depends if you're trying to have a, like, let's say, a Christian political party, or you're trying to have the uh, American Constitution recognize the Lordship of Christ. Those, those are, and that's involvement in politics, but there's nothing wrong with that at all. Clearly, politics are concerned only with the affairs of this world, and therefore to become deeply absorbed in them and have the heart engaged in the pursuit thereof will inevitably turn attention away from eternal things. I mean, that, that, uh, the post-millennial passages talk about kings and queens bowing the knee to Christ and supporting Christ's church with their riches. So obviously, if we're going to have Christian nations that covenant with Christ, there have to be Christians that are engaged in Christian politics. So we have to be careful of what Pink says here. It's kind of a, he's getting to a point of an unbiblical form of pietism. Any worldly matter, no matter how lawful in itself, which engages our attention inordinately, becomes a snare and saps our spiritual vitality. Now that much is true. We greatly fear that those saints who spend several hours a day listening to the speeches of candidates, reading the newspapers on them, and discussing party politics with their fellows during the present election, lost to a considerable extent their relish for the bread of life. Yeah, obviously, you know, if you're talking about simply pragmatic secular politics where we're not fighting for Christ and we're not fighting for the Bible and we're not fighting for a Christian constitution, um, yeah, you are wasting your time. I agree with that. Roman numeral three. Having dwelt at some length in the nature of spiritual decline and pointed out some of the spiritual causes thereof, a few words should be said on its insidiousness. Sin is a spiritual disease, Psalm 103.3. And like so many others, it works silently and unsuspectingly by us. And before we are aware of it, our health is gone. We are not sufficiently on our guard against the deceitfulness of sin. 
Hebrews 3.13, unless we resist its first workings, it soon obtains an advantage over us. Hence, we are exhorted, take good heed, therefore, unto yourselves that ye you love the Lord your God. Joshua 23.11, for all spiritual decline may be traced back to a diminution of our love for him. The love of God is of heavenly extraction, but being planted in an unfriendly soil, it requires guarding and watering, Gar guarding and watering. We are not only surrounded with objects which attract our affections and operate as rivals to the blessed God, but have an inward propensity to depart from him. In the early stages of the Christian life, love is usually fresh and, and fervent. The first believing views of the gospel fill the heart with amazement and praise to the Lord. And a time of grateful affection is the spontaneous outcome. The soul is profoundly moved wholly absorbed with God's unspeakable gift, and weaned from all other objects. This is what God terms the kindness of thy youth, the love of thine espousals, Jeremiah 2, 2. It is then that the one who has found such peace and joy exclaims, I love the Lord because he hath heard my voice, my supplications for mercy, because he hath inclined his ear unto me. Therefore I will call upon him as long as I live, Psalm 116, 1 and 2. At that season, the renewed soul can scarcely conceive it possible to forget him, who has done such great things for it and to lapse back in any measure to his former loves and lords. But if after 20 years of cares and temptations have passed over him without producing this effect, it will indeed be happy. There are some who experience no decline, but that is far from being the case with all. Those who, There are those who speak of the Christians departing from his first love as a matter of course, who regard it as something inevitable. Not a few elderly religious professors who have themselves become cold and carnal, if ever there ha had been life in them, will seek to bring young and happy Christians to this doubtful and God's disarming state of mind. With a sarcastic smile, they will tell the babe in Christ, though you are on the mount of enjoyment today, rest assured it will not be long until you come down. This is an erroneous and utterly misleading. Not so did the apostles act toward young converts. When Barsabbas visited the young Christians at Antioch, he saw the grace of God and was glad. And so far from leading them to expect a state of decline from their inertial fervor, assurance, and joy, he exhorted them all that with purpose of heart they would cleave unto the Lord. Acts 11.23. Now, I've, I've watched a lot of, uh, and listened to a lot of sermons by R.C. Sproul. I really, I like his preaching. And um, he, one thing he says quite a bit, he believes that all denominations will eventually become apostate over time. And I think he believes that based on church history, because it, it's been very, very common. And most have, be, the vast majority have become apostate. And the ones that haven't become apostate are certainly not near as good as they used to be. But they've declined greatly. Uh, I don't think that's necessary. And I, I think we, I don't think that we need to accept declension because it is a constitutional declension. And this is where the original covenanters have it way over modern coven, so-called covenanters and modern conservative Presbyterians. They said, look, we're going to covenant. We're going to stick to what we to our attainments, our spiritual attainments, and we're going to covenant with the Lord and make sure we don't decline. But what is loose subscriptionism? What is the changing of the confession to take into account corruptions in worship, corruptions uh, regarding biblical views of civil government, corruptions regarding this matter and that matter. What is it? It's an acceptance of declension. It's an acceptance of decline. And that's not necessary. But sadly, the, uh, the, the old ways of the covenanters are, are very rare today. And that's one area where, you know, the Steelites at least um, are pointing something out that's very correct. There's no need to compromise with this corruption. And we're, we're, t we're told today, it's just so common, well, things are just corrupt today, so you just have to accept it. You just have to compromise with it. And if the Synod, if the, I've heard people say this, if the, if the Synod or the General Assembly adopts something that's corrupt, well, that's the highest court of the land. You just have to accept it and submit to it. No, that's, that's ridiculous. If they say something wrong, something false, something sinful, something that's a decline from, that's a covenant-breaking decline, we don't have to accept it. There's no need to accept that. But anyway, let me just wrap this up and we'll, we'll stop here. Well, the great head of the church informed the Ephesian saints that he had it against them because they have left their first love, Revelation 
There is no reason or necessity in the nature of things why there should be any abatement in the Christian's love, zeal, or comfort. Those objects and considerations which first gave rise to them have not lost their force. There has been no change in the grace of God, the efficacy of Christ's blood, the readiness of the Spirit to guide us into the truth. Christ is still the friend of sinners, able to save them unto the uttermost that come to God by him. So far from there being good or just reason why we should decline in our love, the very opposite is the case. Our first views of Christ and his gospel were most inadequate and defective. If we follow on to know the Lord, we shall obtain a better acquaintance with him, a clearer perception of his perfections, his suitability to our case, his sufficiency. He should, therefore, be more highly esteemed by us. Said the apostle, Philippians 1, 9, This I pray, that your love may abound yet more and more in knowledge and in all judgment. So far from himself relapsing, as he had neared the end of his course, forgetting the things that were behind, he reached forth to those that were before. And we'll stop there. Um, outstanding. Pink, uh, you know, this book gets better and better as we go forward. Now, I disagree with a couple minor, just a couple very minor things. Um, now, if he's talking about politics as... It is in America where you've got a highly immoral, satanic, democratic party, which is obviously pulling society towards Satanism. And then you have a corrupt Republican Party, which is still a lot better, still a lot more Christian principles followed, but yet uh, embracing homosexuality. Trump was in favor of homosexual marriage, you Trumpsters out there. Trump was totally unchristian in a lot of his views. He was totally indifferent to homosexual marriage and homosexual perversion. He didn't care. He really didn't care. He's not a Christian. So the Republican Party is corrupt. The Democratic Party is super corrupt and super satanic. So yes, but we can work for Christian civil government. We can work uh, to have a Christian constitution. Will it happen in our lifetimes? Well, very likely not. But that's our goal. And that's the goal of the Great Commission. And let us not forget it. And let's apply these principles. Let us not be neglectful in prayer. Learn to pray throughout the whole day. Learn to pray throughout the whole day. You can pray quietly. You can pray while you're taking a walk. You can pray while you thank God and praise God and pray throughout the day. Always be thinking about what Christ has done for you. Always be meditating on what Christ has done. Let us pray. Father, we thank you so much for this wonderful work of Pink. It's very helpful. Ingrain this into our mind. We We've fallen short in many of these areas in the past, sometimes even severely. So help us to be better. Help us to be more consistent. Help us to obey your law in thought, word, and deed. In Jesus' name, amen.